All right, so everybody, uh, David Markarian here from Mentor of the Maya Vision. I've got Dr. Josh Wagner on, and we're going to talk about uh, converting our PI patients to forever patients. And Dr. Josh Wagner is going to go into all these wonderful techniques that he's developed that I find so unique and refreshing because they free us from the old school dogma of the past. And um, his mindset is one that I have a tremendous appreciation for because it is so uh, cutting edge and not only cutting edge, but it's practical and makes sense and meets the need of this society that we have now, which is a very critically oriented society. Uh, people have a lot of um, knowledge about what's going on out there, and they know when they're being uh, scammed. They know when you're not being authentic, and Josh's message is one uh, quite the opposite of that. So, uh, Josh, you want to tell me a little about yourself? Definitely. And David, thanks for having me on. This is one of a few webinars we've done together. Thank you guys for being on this webinar, for taking time out of your most likely practice day, or even if you're off your free time, to get on. And we promise we're going to give you stuff that you can use later today or tomorrow in your practice. Uh, like David said, I've created strategies, I've brought them into the chiropractic profession, uh, many communication strategies that work, and work in the sense that you don't have to feel scripted, you don't have to be a robot, people don't feel like they're a number in your office, and whether that's a cash patient, a PI patient, or anything in between, they work, but I, we know... Um, you know, in the personal injury world, sometimes you can feel like everyone's just a case, and you want to hold on to them as long as you can, you know, whether it's during their case or after, and oftentimes what we've been taught, whether it's been in chiropractic school or by past consultants or from the stage, it doesn't work. So, you know, one question I just want to pose to the audience is, are you making your communication and your relationship with your PI patient about the case, or are you making it about their life? Because when you make it about the case, you know, that's all they're there for. When it's done, it's done. You'll never see them again, and you probably won't get any referrals during it unless they happen to know another person who got in a car accident, which is usually pretty rare. When you make it about their life, and I, I just, David, I just jumped into it. You told me to talk no, about No, that's myself. great. I mean, please. Keep I just going. Want to give you <laughs> when you start making it about their life and you start finding out Obviously, they want to get out of pain. Obviously, they want to rehabilitate their injury. Obviously, they want to see whether it's more mobility or functionability, whatever it may be. When you start digging deeper and forming a relationship with the person, just through certain questions you ask about the difference these disabilities, pain, symptoms, whatever it may be, is making in their life, you start opening up a whole world that's important to them, even though it may not make any difference to you. The difference is in chiropractic, when we try to get people to understand what we understand or know what we know and agree with it, it's very hard. And, and the proof's in the pudding. You know, the past 30 years, we haven't increased our patient base, uh, you know, domestically from whatever small percentage it's been. We haven't increased our healthcare credibility over the past 30 years. And it really was the easiest 30 years to do it because insurance was so great. It was, there was very little barrier of entry for people going to chiropractors and staying with chiropractors. So that's a reason with how we've been doing it hasn't been effective. You know, certain ways can build practices very quickly and high volume, but like David said, times are changing. The public is becoming more aware. Insurance uh, reimbursement is drastically declining, and you've got to come from another level now if you want that to work. So that's what I do in my practice. That's what I share with chiropractors all over the country and world. And the first thing, what I was talking about before, are you making their care about the case, about chiropractic, which neither of those will help for referrals and lifetime care and recognizing you as someone who can get them the results they want in the future, rather than making the care about their life and what they want and what's missing in their life because of their current injury, symptom, pain, subluxation, whatever you want to characterize it as. So David, that was real quick. What's, what's coming up in your mind, or what do you think a typical practitioner on the line is, is thinking or asking right now? Well, you know, first off, we could just end the webinar at this point, because what you just said is probably the most profound thing for, uh, and I'm sure a major, uh, major paradigm shift for everybody, which which I think, and it's so funny because that's my, my next slide, which is, uh, you didn't even know this was here. Huh. 
Um, well, it, and and so what happens is every single one, my every one of the cases that we see, it's always I go into every, all these offices. It's always about the case. It's always about the pain they're in, uh, the insurance paying this, that, whatever. And you just don't. We we get so focused on that, and the whole notion of bringing up their life. It's that's just mind blowing. I mean, that's like the. It's so simple, but it's something that you know. If everybody were to focus on their life instead. We would be meeting their needs in such a grander level, grander scale, and so that alone is just brilliant. And I think, you know, I think more than anything else, everybody's probably thinking right now is, "Wow, I forgot that myself. I didn't even think about it." Right? So, yeah, or, or how do we do it? What does that mean? So, yeah. yeah. Um, how do you give not, us an example? Like, how do you go for? How do you do this? What do you think? What do you give us an example? How you do it? Sure. And just to be clear, it's not about not talking about the pain of the case. It's not that that has to be completely avoided or omitted. It's just that's not the only thing. And if you're forgetting and leaving out what I'm going to share, that's when you're really dropping the ball. So again, it's not about dismissing pain or the case or any of the uh, functional uh, aspects you're assessing. Of course not. But that's like 20% of it. So and that's what most chiropractors, that's all they do. So getting deeper into their life, meaning what are these inj injuries affecting? What is it stopping you from having? And it's not just not being in pain. It's workouts. It's family life. It's work performance. It's hobbies on the weekend. It's sleeping. It's peace of mind. It's everything that an injury or pain or impairment can mess with in their life. And really digging deeply and finding out how this is messing with that. And then when you make the purpose of your care, now this is important, when you make the purpose of your care about getting that back in their life, it's a whole different relationship than just getting out of pain or just uh, whether it's correcting subluxations or something clinical or something chiropractic, which the patients are never really going to understand, and that's never going to bring them back. Never. It, not to say don't bring it up, but that's not the defining factor. It's secondary. And past, yeah, and, and for the past 30 years, we've been taught to believe that education is what patients keep patients coming back. No, it's been the insurance benefits and the pain that's keeping them coming back, not the education. Can guarantee you that. Right. So, it's been a fantasy mm -hmm. to believe that that's what it is, and so you're, I mean, you're dead on with that. And so if we if we do, if we were to alter our, our focus and alter the patient's focus, then we would develop a relationship with them, which is a, a much more important thing. So. And one of the ways to connect with, obviously, you have to go deep. You have to find out what it's getting in the way of, what it's affecting, what it's messing with in their life, and open that up. Find out. Find you know the attributes, the, the results they're looking for, all of that. Because when that case ends, if they don't still have that, then that's a reason for them to continue care. Or they move on, and then three months later or six months later, they realize they're not getting, you know, something comes up. Maybe it wasn't a, a car accident and they realize that's impaired, the whole conversation you were having with them throughout the months that they were getting care was all about that. It's going to be implanted in their mind, you are the solution for that, rather than you're just the solution if they get hit by a car, or you know if they have that uh, same specific pain again. Right. So that's, that's one aspect. And then how to do it, uh, you know, I refer to it as the three essentials. I'll, I'll go over it briefly right now. But definitely get on one, one of my webinars. I do them every week. You go to perfectpatientfunnel.com. You can get on one for the, tomorrow or next week. Right. And in a conversation, in a consult, you have really, even a PI case where, again, you may see them as a number. That's, that's okay. We've been trained to look at it like that. You've mm -hmm. got to connect in the beginning so they start listening to you. And you do that by being able to summarize what they're saying, the words they're using. You know, when someone uses a strong adjective, they use that for a reason. For some reason, that's the way their brain works. Use that adjective. When Mary says, you know, the, the, the sciatica is excruciating, don't say, I know Mary, the sciatica is horrible. That's different in her world. Use the same words. Oftentimes, females, more than males, will tell you, you know, the emotion that's causing it. And I don't mean the emotion like the pain emotion. I mean they're frustrated or they're resigned, like they don't think it's going to get better. Or they're, you know, they're overwhelmed by how much, you know, how much life has changed now that they have this injury. When you let them know that you know how they feel, that takes that connection and that relationship to a whole other level of, wow, this doctor not only listens to me, which may be the first time they've ever felt that, but this doctor cares about me. 
Right. That's a whole other, and then it's not just on that consult, but when then you keep that relationship throughout every visit, it makes a big difference. And then the third aspect, first is words, second is emotion, third is what we've been talking about. It's what they really want, not just getting out of pain, but the difference it's going to make in their life and what they're getting back in their life, you know, sleeping, peace of mind, work performance, the ability to work out, you know, not getting cranky and angry at their husband, getting back in their life what's missing because of the injury. You, that's the, the third tier. That's what really connects it to your care is like the vehicle for them to get what they want in their life rather than you're just a stop in their case amongst whatever other people they have to go to. And you're just, instead of you being a cog in the wheel of their case, you suddenly transform yourself to being a vehicle for, regardless of when the case is over or not, you're positioning yourself as the vehicle for them to get what they want in life uh, from this injury or from future ones that are going to mess with it too. Those three things have to be incorporated in your communication, especially from that first conversation. Also, to add to this, you have to be effective with what you do too. I don't want to skip that part. We, you know, you have to make sure that you. Absolutely, David. That's what I was going to get into. Um, you know, there's two parts of this communication. One is what they hear, and the other is what they see. I was going to let you talk about what they see. And of course, if you're not delivering the goods, they're not going to see change on the screen. Right, and that's where that objective data. One of the things I wanted to go into real quick is uh, the case that I've been working on for the last, it's been four years now, uh, realistically. I'm going to cover that real quick to give you an idea of that importance of the objective data side of it and how it impacts um, the the patient. Uh, uh, in this particular case, our patient was actually a chiropractor, and uh, this has been going on for years. I'm the one that did the test also. Uh, uh, Dr. John Malpe, the former ICA president, was the one that tested her initially. But this this test, was the uh, myovision itself became a major focus of this, leading to something that I've yet to see in the last 30 years, is an attorney literally endorse the product, literally come up and say, hey, without this, this case would have never settled so easily. And it's been estimated that it's probably had it, it doubled the value of the case by having this. One of the reasons is that we were up against a very famous expert witness. The, the most, I, I've never seen anything like this, $1,200 an hour expert witness. And he was such a sharp individual, a UCLA, UCLA professor. And it was myself, doctor, there was two DCs, uh, and there was myself, um, and we were up against uh, this famous expert witness who was an MD, uh, a physiatrist, and he did an excellent job. Uh, one of the things that was really crucial here, and, and it's interesting because the attorneys didn't really understand themselves the value of the subjective data until it was, you know, until it was shown in the case that that the case shifted from being uh, the opinion of one expert versus the opinion of the other expert or experts to one of here's the data. You know, tell me how you can dispute that the data shows the injury was really there, and that's where they fell apart. And it was extremely helpful in re in resolving this case. Uh, and it was a, a million dollar soft tissue case. Um, I can't give you the settlement amount, but believe me, it was way way up there. And this case originally was one no one would take. It was a an offer of I believe zero dollars. Uh, good luck, take care. And it was a chiropractor that was injured in the accident. Um, I want to also point out that one of the things that affected this was the case in Florida, where it was myself and Richard Merritt against all the insurance companies in the United States. It's the largest case since the Wilkes case, and it was. Uh, Literally, they spent millions on it. 75 attorneys, 300 insurance companies. We established the validity of the tool. Very important uh, aspect to why this uh, case was won. Um, and the simple part about it, just to show you the value of this, it wasn't static EMG is great. It's showing you on the side, the left side here. What we did is we measure muscle activity and range of motion simultaneously. And what that does is that when there's when there's actually normal, we see so many patients with normal range of motion. And when they have normal range of motion, uh, we typically that we didn't we did not realize we have not realized that it was a big paradigm shift because range of motion has been what we've been doing for establishing injury in, in soft tissue cases from using the Myovision patented Dynaram where we graph muscle, this is muscle activity being graphed on the top and range of motion at the bottom, 
we were able to establish that so many people with normal range of motion have muscle guarding and pain, and it just doesn't show up in range of motion. So it, it's uh, one of the tools that really separates. This is an example of an, a patient where they have completely normal range of motion, and when you look at them, when you uh, they have the same range of motion when you measure muscle activity simultaneously, but the muscle guarding shows up, and that's three to five percent impairment on the AMA guides. You can see a normal when the person bends into flexion. The muscles here shut off completely in a normal. In someone who's experiencing pain, the range of motion, the degrees are the same here, maybe normal, but you can see the muscles fire like crazy. This stuff is very powerful. It's visual. It's great because we even have now ones where we've tracked progress over time. You can see the changes that occur, and it really helps. Not only it's it, it's as far there's another aspect of this as far as that communication with patients. It establishes you as an expert. I mean, they're in a situation where you know we're in this visual data-driven world, and they're used to seeing, um, when they go to see an MD, they, they, you know, they get a graph showing the, their EKG, and it shows where it's abnormal. They point right to it. So it's the same kind of thing, that we're in this data-driven world, and it really helps to establish the credibility to support the communication that Josh is talking about. This is like the supporting part, the data that helps to support your, your interaction with that patient by providing the data that that's the underpinning. It's sort of like the power of this glass that's so strong that it holds that water. The water is what tastes great. Chiropractic is what solves the problem. But the glass is what it is that keeps it together, and that's part of what this does. Um, and the other thing that was really interesting in why there's been so many attorneys are now uh, wanting to see this is they've been, uh, this came from the, the second largest firm or the first largest firm in the state of Washington where the head of the firm said, you know, we'd spent $1,200 on an MRI. We get an opinion from an MD for $650 for this test paying, two, you know, costing $250. It gives so much more information than either of those two. And the opinion is $650, and it's, it turns into opinion versus opinion against Again, this is a way to actually turn that into a discussion about data. And yes, there's a code for billing it. And yes, it pays very, very well. Um, there's I've, bought, I've battled the insurers on this for years, and now we've established in the personal injury arena, um, we're getting 99% reimbursement. I just want you to know about it. So now, as far as Josh, uh, what you were talking about, I just want to make sure we understood that the things have changed a lot, um, and uh, the importance of using these these three. So, you, going back into this, going into the three things you were talking about, I want you to reiterate where you were going with that, if you could. You know, and I liked the, those. The, the scans are so powerful. What you're showing, that, that's why I was saying that it's what they see, it's what they hear. I'm mainly focused on what they hear. David, obviously, David's technology is what they see. And when you're reiterating, when you're showing those scans, making that, again, not just what you say, but what they see, making those scans about, you know, when they're in right now, phase A, this is what's stopping them from whatever it may be, not being able to drive, not being able to get to work. And they correlate where they are with the scans, not to just the case and the pain, but what's happening in their life, then again, once the case is closed, other people they know in their life that may be injured, can't get to work, or having headaches, can't get, fall asleep, they're going to equate it to you rather than thinking this is case specific. So, you know, just as much with the visual end, um, it's about changing people's perception, not just what you're speaking about. And David, I had a question. I know you do one day seminars, but for docs that are maybe use the myovision but aren't don't have as much certainty, maybe dealing with uh, attorneys or handling a case is, is that something you cover at the one days so yes are... yeah I give them I actually have all the materials I, I provide them on a flash drive I don't want the insurers getting hold of my materials so I give them to them on a flash drive and I have all of the cases um, we've got so many depositions now that and tr and there's so much training information on interacting with attorneys that it really helps a lot to, to have that I've got a great brochure that attorneys seem to love uh, which was one of the slides that was here, but um, that helps with them a lot too. But the training, I do go through the interacting with attorneys, if, that, if that's what you're asking. Um, so they develop that confidence to speak to this. Because one of the other things that's been an issue with, with the attorney side of things is that a lot of the docs are fearful of that arena uh, only because uh, they've been beat up in it or they feel like there's an MD is always going to have more credibility. And one of the, the advantages of this, and, it, and you, if you, 
base the discussion with attorneys around this data, showing what it is you do and you're gathering this data, it changes the whole thing. It's sort of like speaking in front of a crowd with or without a PowerPoint. When you have a PowerPoint, you have graphics to show, it makes a huge difference. Well, the graphics for the body to show what's going on inside the body are, are what makes such a difference to these guys. Everybody's visual. And it makes it so that the playing field is leveled. In other words, MDs don't have an advantage in this situation anymore. We're, I thought we were, I was creating a, a, a method for us to be equals in the courtroom and instead we dominate now because they don't really have data in soft tissue cases they have nothing we have the, the data with the research to support it and it makes it very easy um, so th and that's what you do learn in these classes um, and so and I like the slide that you have on now that's how easy it is to share out you know the, again non case related but the e-scan which myovision has now you know, I teach great referral strategies. It's not about hounding people and asking them for a referral every visit. People hate that. But being able to have your scan on your smartphone that you can just text to someone, show someone when you pull out your phone, like, that is cool. Having stuff that brands your practice and people are interested in showing someone else, like a talking point, yep. that's really cool. Yep. And they, it makes you look so cool. I, I've seen so many people, they go to dinner after or lunch after they see you. What's the first thing they do is they pull this out and show, because it shows up on your phone 10 seconds later, they show, hey, look what I just saw, what I did at my chiropractor. What do you think they're going to ask? Well, how do I get one of these done? You know, so you, and, and it's a great way for patients to actually show. One of the things that, that this did, does for them too, um, this, the communication with the patient is so important, as Josh is talking about. But one of the things that we've, we, we always skip and we forget exists, I'm sure we don't forget, but we, we seem to ignore it, is, is the family members. And uh, Josh, I know you know what I'm talking about here. You have a, a patient who goes home, and they're done, and I've seen this so often, and the e-scan has been so powerful that way. A patient's done, uh, they've been, their PI case is over. They want to still see their chiropractor. And everyone at home is saying, or many people, like the usually it's the, uh, the women, their husbands will say, you know, why are you still seeing your chiropractor? Your, your pain is, you're done. Uh, your PI case is settled. And w the number of patients I saw in beta testing with the e-scan that said they showed their husband this objective data validating that they still needed the chiropractor was amazing to me. So, Josh, how do you deal with that aspect with the family members? Yeah, good, good question. So on, on your end, that's a great, you know, they have the visual component where they can't really mess it up. They can't mix the words you said. So there's that end. There's objective, easy to read, easy to look at data. On the other end, uh, a woman, a man, anyone that's leaving your office is never going to be able to articulate whatever you told to them. You know, they're not going to remember more than 20% of it. The 20% you did, they did remember, they're not going to be able to share with their spouse why they need the care. But what happens is when someone wants something, let's say in a relationship, whether it's the female or the man, the reasons, the convincing doesn't have to be there. Like, you know, if a mother wants something for their child, she's going to get it for her. It, she doesn't have to convince the husband to pay for it. No. You know, Johnny is going to have this. Johnny's going to summer camp. The same thing. I have docs all the time in my program. You know, just a couple weeks ago, a couple out in California were telling me, he said this was the worst consult he's ever been through because the husband who, atten who or the, the worst uh, report of findings ever, he's ever did, the husband decided to come with the, his wife, and he's very analytical, and he had, you know, cross-armed, stern face the whole time, and was just asking for studies and all that. And the doc did what I shared with him to do, and it, you know, it wasn't about that. It was about listening to exactly what that woman wanted. And he was, you know, even though he's been in practice 30 years, he was shaken up throughout the whole consult because this guy was so hard to speak to and so abrasive. And when it was over, you know, he said, we're going to need to think about this. And he asked me, and I gave him a few little pointers that he could could have done differently, but I said, listen, that's one in 32 years. That's not going to be the typical going forward. He calls me the next week, and he says to his surprise, four days later, because when they left, they didn't start care. Four days later, the wife was in the waiting room saying, I'm ready to start now without the husband. You know, she convinced him because the chiropractor was on her side, not the side of chiropractic, not the side of subluxation, not even on the case it was all about her and what she wants. And when it comes down to it, people are going after what they want. They're not looking for a new paradigm on health, no matter what commercial or stage speaker tells you. You know, they're, they're not looking for a whole new philosophy on health. When someone comes into you, 
they are in pain. They are in an emotionally stressful situation. They're vulnerable, they're anxious, they're nervous. You know, they, they, can't, they haven't been able to solve this on their own. When you try to, to uh, communicate logically, and education is in that realm of logic, it doesn't penetrate someone when they're in an emotional state. Right. So by using the essentials, it allows someone to first like feel comfortable with you, like you, respect you, trust you, and then over time, not on the first visit, not on the second visit, but over time, like through the case, through their care recommendations, then you could hope to establish some education and understanding, but the bottom line is it always comes down to getting the person what they want. And so if you don't even know what that is, if you never ask, you're always going to be behind the eight ball. And no like re-exam report of findings is going to save you if you didn't start on the right foot and continue that throughout the entire case. Great. That's great. Um, that's very, very helpful stuff. And, and uh, we have to remember to do that with everybody. And it opens up so much uh, opportunity uh, and to help. The other thing is that also, you know, it also reaches the family members in that I've seen so many that were negative about chiropractic care and negative about their you know, going along with it, but negative about uh, having their their family members seeing a chiropractor uh, after an injury is over switch switch over to actually by properly communicating with them switch over to actually becoming a patient themselves that's happened so often um, and one of the things I want to point out here is the new software does the EP stress score what that is just so you understand it's a sum of all the muscle activity and the research studies have shown that it works correlates very highly with uh, provides an objective means of something like an Oswestry or VAS score. And by summing it, it makes it very easy to see the changes over time. A patient comes in, this is a pre and post adjustment scan, you can see these changes. So not, so it actually removes the issues of, with static EMG, there was always the question, why do the muscles fire more on the left or the, or the right sides in one test, and they don't. They switch sides on another test. Well, when you're in a standing position, sway becomes an issue, but when you actually sum all the data on left and right sides, it normalizes it and no longer do you see that? You'll see test retest uh, reproducibility goes significantly higher that way. Uh, the studies are real solid on it. It's a great way to actually communicate with the patient. Uh, and one of the things that you know I want you to see, think about with this is consider it like a blood pressure cuff for spinal health because that's kind of how you want to use it. You're tracking their progress over time. Everybody's a little bit different. There isn't a, a complete normal, but you want to see and it reflects their what's happening in their lives too. Um, very important stuff. Uh, screenings, I want to just point out how valuable those can be. A lot of new grads are getting a score, and I'm just pointing out an opportunity for everybody, and they don't know what they're going to do. If you were to get them out and screening for you, you'd be amazed to see um, how many patients would, would come and see you. This is not in the realm of, of directly communication, but it is in that it's a way to get out there, and those that don't, don't want to do screenings get students doing for you. Uh, it's not unprofessional to do screenings. I've never seen a pharmacy that didn't have a blood pressure cuff in it, and that's a screening built right into the pharmacy, so we should be doing the same things as long as we're legitimate about it. And, and th th those three essentials that I talked about absolutely must be used at a screening if you want someone, you know, cold off the street to feel comfortable with you and to feel, wow, could this be a person be the answer? Um, if you're not using those three essentials, if you're trying to teach them chiropractic or hard sell anything, um, you're going to have, you know, that's why people hate screenings because they're doing the same scripted robotic conversation with 40 people. I was there, that's how I, my grad school experience, hated it. When you're having a unique, unique conversation with everyone, it all changes, whether that's outside the office or in your recommendations and consults. I have a question for you. I, had a, I was at a screening where uh, a person came up to the chiropractor and said, uh, I don't know how my, I'd have to ask my orthopedic surgeon um, how he feel about chiropractic care. He was obviously picking a fight with him. Um, he responded by, it's, it's, basically yelling at the guy and saying that, uh, that you know, we, we, they go to medical school as much, blah, 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 you know, the courses that are covered, et cetera. How do you deal with that? How would you deal with someone who actually brings that kind of a thing up at a screening? Uh, well, well, a couple of things. Obviously, you know, c convincing a man against his will is of the same opinion still. So any amount of justification or, or, or trying to compete or fight is, is not going to win. The, the guy's coming up obviously sounding like trying to, pick a fight if that's what he was. Right. So in my mind, I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even entertain, I wouldn't even waste my time, I would move on to the next person. If it felt like the person was truly 
antagonizing or picking a fight. Mm -hmm. If it seemed like they were completely just naive and really thought they needed to ask their orthopedist, uh, then I would start engaging them with questions and asking, you know, well, why? And, and using what they tell me and seeing where you can kind of break that framework, that, that mentality of whatever they think, you know, they, their orthopedist needs to let them know. Right. Um, you know, you, you're going to always do your best when you find out what's in that person's head. So instead of trying to teach them a lesson or anything, right. it, Bring out what's in them, and then see is there is their stuff reasonable or not, and uh, use the three essentials. You know, again, use their words. Make sure they know you listen to them. Under show them, hey, I understand this is a concern for you. Literally, that's the second essential right there. Their emotion, they're concerned. Mm -hmm. Again, assuming they weren't trying to antagonize you, and the end result is they want to get better and. They're doing their due diligence. That you know, they may feel that they want to ask their orthopedist, but they truly just want to get better and dive into whatever they're, whatever they're suffering from, assuming they're suffering from something. Yep, that's great, and that's exactly what I did in this situation. I, I validated them, saying, you know, that makes complete sense. You really do want to ask your, if, if you have respect for the person, it's great to ask them about it, and and say, and just I uh, pointed out that this is just something very different, and it's another alternative to it. And instead of fighting with them, um, you have to validate, you know, individuals, and that's what you're saying. You have to validate their concerns, otherwise the door closes. You know, the second yeah. you argue, the door closes. And then you know, I, I have a lot of docs in the program who are starting to get a lot of MD referrals. And one of them, uh, you know, one of the little things I told them was obviously whether it's MDs, chiropractors, we all have, you know, we want to be respected, we all have superiority, whatever, mm -hmm. and MDs especially. And when you correlate, with, you know, to get MD referrals, correlating, again, it's all about what does that person want, the patient that we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, but also from the MD, they want the respect, they want the authority. So just by referring to it, and again, I know this isn't, how you may think or feel or even the truth, <laughs> correlate into the MD as, you know, this is your patient. This, this is what I'm doing with your patient. Just changing certain language with that will have an MD want to deal with you so much more than ever feeling you're going to steal a patient, ever feeling there is animosity or you're better than him or anything like that. And, hey, I, you know, I don't agree with the majority of stuff the MDs do, but I'm not, you know, it's different when you're going into a relationship where you have to co-manage a patient, and uh, yeah, so it's you, all you, about you can develop a really good relationship with them by what you're describing, and that's how they get educated. The truth, I found something out really fascinating about that, and this is really, really interesting that you bring this up. A chiropractor here locally has had phenomenal success interacting with MDs, and her insight on what's been happening has been just really fantastic. What she pointed out was, now what was interesting was the way she actually developed a relationship with them, inadvertently, she wasn't trying to, was she would send the dynamic, the Dynarom test data to the MD with the patient or for the patient. And that, I mean, it was really interesting, sort of like guys with cars. They don't want to talk directly to each other, but when there's a car to talk about, uh, they're willing, they're going to, it opens up that door for communication. What was really interesting was she said, prior to actually sending the data to the, to the MDs, I thought they just, they didn't like us. They didn't know. And the truth is they really didn't know what we did and they didn't right. know what questions to ask because it was all, there was no data to it, and they're very data-oriented. She said when they saw the graphs, it suddenly they had something to talk about, and they wanted to ask questions. What do the graphs mean? What does this mean with the patient? Oh, yeah, that correlates with what I'm seeing too. And she said she has a whole other level. They have a whole other level of respect for her professionally, but more than anything, she said it wasn't that they hated us. They didn't know what we did, and this was a way to actually show what we did uh, and it made it easy, very easy for her to communicate with them. And, and, they, and she said that one thing that she learned was that they need data to talk about. Otherwise, there's nothing to talk about with them. So it's, uh, you know, what do the test results mean? What is the data? What does their blood work say? What is this? That's what MDs do. And this opens, this provides that data. Does that make sense, Josh? Yeah. And, and, and the data you're producing, it's completely professional looking. It makes sense. Right. Uh, you know, for instance, if you're an upper cervical doc and you send the, the MD, your upper cervical x-rays with your analysis, that is, that it doesn't make any sense to them. Again, as much as that is the answer for that patient, you've got to correlate it to who you're speaking with. So right. that would make no sense and they'll think you're crazy, you're a whack job. Just like David's saying, it's not that they hated us, it's that they didn't know anything about us. 
Now, hey, some MDs probably do hate chiropractors because they've, they've had experience where the chiropractor is bashing the MD. You know, it happens both ways, of course. Right. So, yes, yeah, sending the information that can relate on their level, documenting what you're doing, and yes, stroke their ego. Again, this isn't about who's right or who's, uh, you know, this is, do you want the patient coming to you? Do you want more referrals? Do you want more visits? Obviously, yes. So if it takes stroking their ego to get more referrals in a good relationship, go for it. At the end of the day, who cares? Right. So It's yeah, not about yeah. dominating. It's about educating. Yeah, you know, be bigger than the ego of yourself and let them buy into that. If they're funneling you patients, that's all that counts. Uh, right. You know, the... the yeah, it's, That's it's true. all about that. It's all about getting out of your own way. Right. So, Josh, tell us about Perfect Patient Funnel. That's one thing that we haven't discussed yet. Tell us what you do. It is an online program for chiropractors showing you how to increase your practice easier than harder, no struggle, no strain. The base foundation are just these absolute amazing communication strategies from first visit onward from referral strategies to reactivation strategies to marketing in your community more effectively. And it is uh, not the same old practice management stuff that's been reiterated the past 30 years. I can guarantee you that. Uh, rather than hear from, you know, hear from the horse's mouth is look at, go on perfectpatientfunnel.com, look at the testimonials from docs all over the world, uh, docs a year out, docs 35 years in practice. And uh, get on one of the webinars. Actually look at, you know, Hear me speak. I'll go into the three essentials. I'll outline a consult for you, how to best effectively do it, most effectively do it, and you can the next day in practice using it. I mean, just what I told you right now, the three essentials, uh, MD strategies, you can use that tomorrow. Uh, David, if you scroll down, you can click on – oh, this is cool. I thought you just had set slides. Scroll down, and there'll be a thing under this for see all testimonials. Way at the bottom? Uh, right there, right there. There Just we go. It. And yeah, so you can see docs from, you can see a name and a face from all over the world, just seeing great results. You know, just just yesterday, uh, she hasn't given me permission for her last name, but Brianne in Illinois, you know, two years out in practice, emailed me because she's so excited. One, she's sitting down with a neurosurgeon this week who wants to start referring patients to her. And more importantly than that, she says she has so much more confidence and certainty in going over recommendations. It's so much easier for her, and people are just accepting care so much easier. Uh, you know, the, the same doc in California I talked about, he mentioned in the first nine weeks, no, the first, uh, yeah, first nine weeks in the program, he started getting more referrals of family members than the past, like, nine years in practice. And he didn't even hit the referrals module yet. That's not till like month three, <laughs> just to give you an example. But that's great. The, the dynamic you create with a patient, that's going to make the biggest difference in someone referring. It's not how much you hound them. I give the example all the time. If you go to a great movie or a dinner, if the manager asks you to refer someone, you know, we both know that makes no difference. What makes a difference is your experience at that movie, your experience at that dinner. Same thing in your office. That's why people want to have their family come in. That's why they want to tell their friends about you. It's the experience in the office. The Myovision great, you know, creates a great experience that people can take with them. Certain communication takes a, takes, uh, gives off a great experience. What I found is a lot of the communication that's drilled into chiropractors over the last 30 years causes the opposite. It either causes overload of way too much education and confusion which when people get confused, they do nothing or they back up. Or there's forcefulness or some fear. You know, there's that whole conversation. If you don't do something, you're going to get, you're, you know, you're going to be so much worse off and it's going to be horrible and you need to fix this today and you need to sign on the dotted line. You know, none of that. So really gently and professionally taking people from can chiropractic help me to can I begin care right now? That's the, that's the biggest difference. And in this day and age, 
whether it's PI cases, cash, uh, you've got to be able to have those conversations effectively. That's great. So let's do this. Um, everybody, go to perfectpatientfunnel.com. Check his, his website out. Get to know Josh. He's really a, a thought leader um, in the profession from my perspective, and I've seen uh, how well he he treats others and other individuals in this arena, and he's actually excellent at what he does. I love his mindset. I love his paradigm. So go to that, and uh, let's uh, let's thank you all for being here today. I uh, appreciate it greatly, and thanks, Josh, for being on. Um, thank you, David. And thank you for all you do. I really, I really appreciate you too. Thank you very much, man. Okay, take care. Goodbye, everybody.